Hi, welcome to Painting in Oils. I want to call this Dead and Alive, but um, didn't think that was a very good title, not very attractive. So it's called La Peau de Jean Jambre et Hortensia. Hortensia is the French or Latin word for uh, hydrangeas, as we call them in the UK. Um, dead or Alive came from the fact that one of them is a beautiful bright pink colours and the other one's in the faded colours, and I, but I didn't want to make it too brown. The drawing was made using paint, a mixture of permanent rose, Prussian blue and a touch of yellow to give the dark, the grey. So um, I started off using a pointed brush to draw out and plot what I was going to then paint. I then used titanium white to mark out where I could see where the really bright whites were. These will end up getting painted over at some point, but um, they're there for reference to give me an idea of where I want them to be. With oils we work from dark to light, so when painting the flowers, starting with the, the alive hydrangea, I used a mixture of violet and permanent rose to give me the dark print, dark pink. The dying hydrangea, the lights, I used azure blue, touch of the yellow and white. And then I've gone back in, working in the darks, blending some of them and leaving them, some of them with just one touch of a brush. Also looking at the shapes around the flowers, not just at the flowers. Looking at the shapes of the shadows between leaves and the shadows on leaves and on the box behind. Please keep remembering, look at your subject more than you look at your canvas. You're almost painting blind on the canvas because you're looking at the subject more. If you look at the shadows, they can reflect the colours of what is casting the shadow too. It's not because there's a slight reflective effect. My dark green mix is made with the yellow, burnt sienna and some Prussian blue with a touch of French red. You can use scarlet lake or cadmium red, just a tiny touch, just to give it a bit of warmth. Then I've lightened that with the azure blue, the yellow and titanium white to give me the lighter. Always, when mixing colours, always add the darker colour to your palette first. Bear in mind when you're painting, don't try and lighten things all the time. Sometimes putting something dark next to something light will make it look lighter counterbalances it. So if you put dark behind something light it will push the light thing forward and if you put light behind a dark thing it will make it will push the dark thing forward. Sounds a bit odd but it does work. You may notice that on this piece of the painting, I'm working with two brushes, one with the dark on and one with the light on. Same contamination between the uh, two values. I mix all my own greens. If you use a limited palette, your colours and your painting have got something in common with each other. If you use a lot of ready-made, colours then they won't knit together and look as pleasing to the eye on the, on the canvas. And greens aren't always just yellow and blue. I often use red to darken them down. Uh, burnt sienna which has got red tinges in it.
When when you're putting paint on the canvas, you're laying it. We will do some blending at a later point. But if you lay down your marks and leave your marks, you don't need to blend everything. It looks more lively. I always think a painting should have a rhythm to it. So I've added more white to my pink mix here to put the lighter pieces, lighter petals, the hydrangeas. Always think of three tones within every component of your painting, at least a medium, a darker medium and a light. The darker layers, as with the drawing, I add more dilutant to. So it's quite a washy, if you're used to working with watercolours, it's quite a washy cons consistency. But you can still work fat over lean because you want all the layers to dry at the same rate to prevent cracking in oils. So each subsequent layer has a higher concentration of paint in. I'm working alla prima, I don't add oil. That is the reason for having a lot of dilutant in the underlayers and a lot less. Modern oil, tube oil paints have a lot of oil in them anyway. So it isn't always necessary. And of course adding oil extends the drying time. Which when I'm travelling and working, I don't want the paints, paintings to stay wet for a long time. You'll see within the painting... There's more focus on the life hydrangea. It's more central, it's the subject of the painting more than anything else. The one on the edge is the drying one, but it adds some colour interest and some contrasts. So again, that difference between dead and alive. The edge of your painting doesn't always have to have a lot of detail in. It can fade away, which makes the central subject more prominent. I think I've already mentioned about one touch marks. You don't always want to blend because it can kill colour and it can kill the liveliness of the painting. So just touch, let the brush bounce off the paint. You're laying it on, not pushing it into the canvas. You see here I'm putting the central, very light blobs into the centre of the flowers on the live hydrangea. You can't see those on the drying one on the left. We might start off with the dark layers, but that doesn't mean you can't go back in and re-establish darks at a later stage, or lights. I mean, really the highlights should be the last marks you make on the canvas, but it doesn't always work out that way. Really look at where the light catches. Remember with round things, the piece that is most forward sticking out will be catching more light than any other part of that component of your painting of the subject. So the front of the round ginger jar, the front of the glass, the front of the round hydrangea will all catch the light more than that that is further away from you. And one of the reasons for working with the subject in a box is that do you have a constant light? I, mean, I finished this off on the second day and the live hydrangea had started to wilt but at least I'd done, I'd completed most of it and had the background and the ginger jar which obviously was more stable but the light was still the same it hadn't varied. The brushes I used are short-handled Rosemary & Co. Eclipse brushes. I like, I've found recently that 
I feel I'm making better marks with the short handled brushes. And travelling, they fit into my pochard box for working on plein air. Don't have as much weight to them. And I really like the mixture of the flats, the Langdachin and the points. They've got a good range of sizes in their Eclipse set. So you can make lots of different marks. Your marks need to be of different sizes. Generally in the background you would use smaller marks and in the foreground larger marks to give you a depth along with your variation of tone. Cold colours in the background and warm colours in the front. It's just part of your weaponry, your kit in your head when you're creating a painting. And always remember to keep looking at that subject. Right, we're looking at the glass now. This was brought on at the Crant in the nearest city to us, Bézier. Your marks where the light catches it and where the shadow is in the background will give you the shape of the glass. Yes, we've drawn in the shape with the original layer of paint, but then that is built up and given shape and depth by looking at the tones of shadows, the values of shadows, how the light hits it. And some of those white marks will remain there or I'll re-establish them later. Also looking at the level of the water, how the water changes the shapes, reflects shadow, reflects light, refracts the stems. There was actually a leaf in the water here as well which I haven't looked at in much detail but it just gives a different colour within the water as well, not just the background colour of the box that it's standing in. Right, this is where I'm tonking, named after a professor at the Slade Art School. I found that there was too much paint on the canvas, too much detail on that leaf under the hydrangea. So I just laid on newsprint and just lifted the oil off. The layers of paint are left there, but the excess is lifted off. And it is an official name, tonking. It just means that you can go leave it soft, it softens the edges, softens the layers, or you can just lift off extra paint. And that there was, don't be frightened of wiping off if you think you made an error. Oil paint wipes off canvas and you can paint over it. I've got a, black, a grey background. Um, this is a linen canvas and the grey background is a mid-range tone and I like the way that the colours sit on it. Sometimes I'll use a complementary colour if I want blue skies to stand out on, I use an orange background. But the grey is a pretty neutral colour to paint on and quite pleasing on the eye. Keep looking at that subject. We're now looking at the ginger jar. So I'm looking at the pattern. Not going to be an exact copy. I am an impressionist painter after all. So I'm using pure Prussian blue for the pattern. Again, and, and I've got two brushes there. One's got the blue on, one's got white on, but it's not just white. There's quite a yellow light reflected from the cardboard of the box. So it is titanium white with just a tiny touch of the yellow. But again I'm looking, I know the, the ginger jar doesn't start off as a very good shape, I have to keep adjusting and keep adjusting. But the more you look, the more you see. I always paint what is there rather than what you think is there. And of course the pattern on the uh, jar has to follow the curve of the jar too. It's not just straight down. It follows the uh, circular shape and gives the jar shape. It would be tempting to paint the whole jar white and then put the pattern on. 
but when you're working alla prima that is a very difficult thing to do without disturbing the paint underneath. I will end up doing that with the lid and you'll see that the lid doesn't need that much detail. Lots of decisions going on here. What shall I do next? It's just blending that white with a touch of yellow into the shadow I've already placed on there. Just remember, I send about one touch marks. Just think that when you put one touch on, you're putting paint on. If you put touch that same area again you'll be lifting paint off. So one touch on and leave. Or if you feel it needs blending, then blend it. Very little pressure on the brush. Too much pressure on the brush and it will not stay on the canvas. said your brush should be bouncing over the canvas, dancing with light feet. You're laying the colour on. You can see the difference in the white on the jar to the white of the light on the glass. White on the glass is pure light, pure white. Whereas there is a touch of yellow in the jar. And if you can hear a hooter outside, apologies. <laughs> you can see with that mark there, that that's pure white compared with the uh, rest of the jar where the light is catching and there's a bit more yellow in that People find in their heads that the oils are a difficult medium to use. I prefer them, I prefer traditional oils because they're so buttery and a joy to work with. And as long as you remember the fact to lean process. Fat overly process, then they're not a problem. They're easy to use and they've got such a richness in pigments. Okay, we need to think again about water distorting and refracting objects and light. But I'm just looking at shapes of the lights and the darks and the blocks of colour. I'm not actually painting a jar. Oops. That's raw sienna. Too strong. Too strong. Maybe a little bit where there's shadow. Shadows aren't just Grey. So I'm putting the colour of uh, the box. I did debate what colour to paint the box, but uh, didn't know whether to do tiles or wallpaper in the background or something similar. But I actually quite like the raw sienna colour of the cardboard in the box. And, uh, so I'm putting some of that colour just very lightly over the top of where I've marked shadows. If you look at Impressionist paintings of Renoir and Manet and Monet and others of that group, you can see that they use 
and Van Gogh's as well. And I used the shadow, complementary shadows. So if they wanted a red light at sunset, they would use red tinted shadows. If they wanted the yellow to stand out as sunflowers, they'd use purple shadows. And if they wanted green to stand out, they'd use red shadows. Blues and orange. So, I've, I, when I first started painting, I didn't think that I'd use colour theory much, but then you find yourself using it. And so it's one of the tools in your toolbox. You want something to put, look more green, put a red dot at the side of it. Something to be a brighter yellow, put some purple nearby. And of course, don't forget that glass is transparent, it's not just white. So you can see that I've looked at where the shadow and the uh, colour of the box is behind it. So you've still got the shadow of the ginger jar, but you've got the light catching it too. So to lighten up my sienna, I've added titanium white to it. And I'm looking at the reflection of that light behind. So the marks of that glass have got to shape the glass. They're not just straight down and straight across it. Look, I'm looking at the shapes and the way it blends into the back, the way the light catches. And you've got the reflection of the light on the background. Reflection of the glass. Catching. Maybe that makes it look more 3D. It should do. I hope it does. You've really got to look at the water level and the shape. Lots of little marks rather than big ones. Oh, where am I going now? Again, looking at the water level. Keep looking at that subject, not just at the canvas. Can't stress that enough. Right, we're ready for some lighter, some light in the background. The looser you wear, okay, hold your brush, the more accurate your marks are. might sound a bit odd, but if you tighten it and hold it like a pen, your marks aren't going to be loose and painterly. It will be very tight. Working around objects can be difficult and you'll see in a while I turn the canvas upside down being a lefty, a gaucheur as we say in France. It's sometimes easier that way. It's like painting skies around buildings. It's a lot easier for me to turn it upside down. Also painting branches on trees because you're pulling them away from the trunk rather than pushing them up into the sky. It looks a lot more natural. Lots of little marks rather than following around with one line. One that gives a more natural edge to the leaf and the shadows that are cast. If 
you think about shadows, they have a halo effect. The nearer they are to the subject that's casting the shadow, the darker they are, and then they move out and become lighter towards the edge of the shadow. Where the article casting the shadow meets the shadow, meets the shadow, the tone will be the same. If you look at the left side of the live hydrangea, you can't actually see where the shadow touches the hydrangea because the bit that you can see is well away from the shadow. The tone will be the same where right behind the hydrangea, probably where the stem it meets the stem. That shadow pushes that hydrangea forward. And you can see on that leaf below where I'm working now, the dark bit at the top makes it look as though it's, the leaf is folded and the light bit underneath, the light half, comes forward. And that again is pushed forward by the darker shadow behind it. So you've got three layers there. You've got the dark top of the leaf, the light bottom and then the dark shadow underneath pushing that leaf away from the canvas. Using the paint on the it's on the already on the canvas here, blending and dragging. An artist tutor once said to me, You need busy bits and then you need calm bits within a painting. You don't want it all to be too busy and you don't want it all to be too calm. You need the eye to travel around the painting. You may be questioning why I've only got half the ginger jar and not all of the drying hydrangea on the left or the base of the vase. I like the painting to go out of the canvas. I like the story to continue elsewhere. I don't like things to be fitted into boxes. Francis Bacon used to paint a totally different style, obviously. But he loved putting boxes round things in his work. Maybe they were ready to break out. Whereas I don't like things being contained within a box. Our house is called La Liberté, which translates as freedom. And I think I find that here in France. Going back and reinstating some darks. Reshaping this ginger jar. Round things are such a challenge. Oh, here we are moving, turning it upside down to make it easier to work. It can also give you some idea if you turn it upside down of the perspective and other elements of the painting appear to be correct. Because you're looking at shapes rather than trying your eye and your mind trying to make it into a vase with a flower with a jar. You're looking at shapes. Do those shapes fit? Hardly touching the canvas here. Wiping the brush between marks so I'm putting white on now and spreading blue white.
And I have got more white in the paint that I'm putting on there rather than the yellow white. So some of this jar we've gone from the mix at the start of permanent rose Prussian blue and yellow. Then we've gone on to the white with a touch of yellow and now we're really looking at where the light is really catching this jar. And reshaping things. For the really fine highlights you can have a bit more diluting so it will help it lay on top of the paint that's already on there. And sometimes, I haven't with this paint, but sometimes I use a medium called Venetian Red, Venetian Medium, which um, helps paint lay on top. I just add a tiny dot to the mix and it will help the paint lay on top. Really look at the glass and see how the light bends with the shape of the glass. Gives you the curves. That is pure white, pure titanium white I'm using there. Are they concave or convex? Is the light at the back or the front of the jar? of the glass. Blending some of the light in places to give a contrast with those pin points catching the light. I've got a daylight bulb over my easel, which uh, is to the right of where I'm, well, over where I'm painting, but to the right of where I have the still life set up. Still life is on the left. I hope you're not falling asleep yet. This is the first time I've done a commentary without actually talking whilst I'm painting. And <laughs> normally I'm a lot more lively. I think my voice sounds uh, quite soft what it normally does. You can find that when I'm doing painting demonstrations it is a little bit like a monologue on stage and you uh, have to be entertaining. When I'm sitting here watching the video and uh, recording my voice, sort of a bit more conscious of it. Maybe the next video I do, I will do it, speak as I am painting. The problem with my studio is that there's cars going past and uh, when they catch that, I'll have to get, find my headphones, I think, and the uh, microphone might help. Alright, there's two minutes to go. With the credits at the end of the uh, video, I have put the colours that I've used and the brushes, details of my website. 
I do run painting holidays here down in France. I'm working with a French artist on September 2023. Um, Johan Hoverdijk, who's from Lille. I don't think he's not been down to this part of France before. I met him in Paris in February and he asked me if I wanted to work with him. And so we're running en tant cordial. Rather than en tant cordial. So it'll be four four day workshop in English and French. And it will be life models, portraits, plein air painting and some still life. I'm really looking forward to working with him. So if you want to join me you can email me. Well, I'll turn it back again and now re-establishing the shadows behind the jar. Looking at that subject again. And I think we're nearly there. Turn it black and white if you can on your computer and you'll see whether you have got the um, tones right. If you can still tell what your subject is on your painting. Thanks for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've learnt something. If you've got any questions, please contact me via my website. Take care. Thanks. Bye.